speaker number four. Hello and welcome to Nebraska on this wonderful spring day. My name is Ben Gotchel. That's B-E-N-G-O-T-S-C-H-A-L-L. -L. I'm a fourth generation Nebraska rancher and District 5 president of the Nebraska Farmers Union. The Keystone export pipeline is not in the national interest and it is most certainly not in Nebraska's interest. Governor Heineman betrayed Nebraskans and his word when he used an inadequate map that didn't describe soil and groundwater conditions to approve a route that crosses a significant portion of the Ogallala Aquifer. In fact, more miles of the aquifer would be crossed by the proposed route than before. The proposed route still crosses portions of the sand hills as well as many areas with highly permeable soils and shallow water tables, which has always been our greatest safety concern. According to the State Department's own information, a pinhole leak could release an amount of benzene that could contaminate enough water for 2 million people to drink for up to 425 days. Nebraskans do not want that risk. Our landowners have been left to fend for themselves against an onslaught of dishonest land agents and corporate bullies who impose a lose-lose scenario. Either accept TransCanada's terms and a one-time offer for a permanent perpetual easement, or TransCanada will take the rights to your property through eminent domain. This land grab scheme is an extortionist racket and should be outlawed. Nebraska lawmakers... Nebraska lawmakers violated our state constitution by passing LB 1161, which took oversight authority over pipelines away from the elected body of the Public Service Commission and gave it to the governor and his appointed staff at the Nebraska Department of Environmental Quality. The NDEQ report conducted by TransCanada's contractor, HDR, was a miserable failure. For example, it ignored the economic impacts of a spill on grazing land and livestock wells. Nebraska has a $21 billion agriculture economy. Livestock make up over two-thirds of Nebraska's farm income. Cattle are our top agricultural product. We are first in the nation in red meat production. To not even mention the risks to livestock in their study is not a minor oversight on the part of the NDEQ. It is gross incompetence. It is an affront to Nebraska's livestock producers. Real Nebraskans will never give up our land, our water, and our property rights so foreign corporations can enrich their shareholders and we can be left to subsidize the cleanup when their pipeline leaks. That is why I stand here with fellow Nebraskans and fellow Americans to urge President Obama to once again deny the permit for the Keystone Export Pipeline. Thank you. Hello, I'm Jane Klebb, leader of the Bold Nebraska Group. I didn't have time to go back and get my written speech, so I have a few notes uh, on my iPhone. I'll try to remember most of it. My first message is to President Obama. I mean, he is the main decision maker. We know that the staff at the State Department work every day to make sure that this process is fair. We don't think it's been fair so far, and there are a few things that we want to see done differently. But to President Obama, our message is really clear. He asked us to be the change we want to see in this world. His whole campaign revolved around citizens being the change we want to see. That is exactly what every single person standing is doing. And we're telling President Obama, it's your turn. It's your turn to be the change that you've talked about in your 2008 race. It's your turn to be the change you've talked about in your novel address. And it's your turn to be the change that you said to KETV television in Omaha when they got an opportunity to visit with you in your White House. You told them that Nebraskans are not gonna take a few thousand jobs if that means risking our water in the future of our ad land. We're asking you to honor those words. We know that these are good jobs for families. There is no doubt about that. But what TransCanada then puts through that pipeline is not good for our families. 
and that is not fair. They are good jobs for two years, and then we assume the risk for the rest of our lives, and that is not okay. The water analysis in the EIS is not sufficient. There has not been a worst case scenario spill analysis on the Ogallala Aquifer, the Platte River, the Niobrara River, the countless family wells. We want to see that proper water analysis done. There has never been a landowner rights analysis done. The one contract that actually stands on this project is between the landowners whose families homesteaded the very land that a foreign corporation is about to take. And you have not done an analysis on what that means for those landowners. Their property will mean less value. When a spill happens, they will not be able to sell that land. This is ag land. And just like those folks in Arkansas, we can't just sell our land, or sell the home back to Exxon. We can't just sell our home back to TransCanada. This is land that's been in families' hands for over 100 years. And we don't take kindly to foreign corporations coming in and telling us that they're going to take it. So when your bulldozers try to cross our line in the state of Nebraska, Every single person will be here saying, no, not in our land, not in our water, not in our country. Thank you. Speaker number 15. And if speakers 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20, if you're prepared to speak when your name is called, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is David Druding, and I'm here from my home in Arkansas. And, and I grew up in Michigan, and what I have for you today is four photographs and some narrative about two pipeline ruptures that happened in July of 2010 in Michigan, not far from where I was born. And also, more recently, uh, two and a half weeks ago, the pipeline rupture that happened to a, an Exxon pipeline, uh, Pegasus, not far from my home. So uh, what we'll do is we'll start with the July uh, 2010 uh, Enbridge uh, tar sands pipeline rupture in the Kalamazoo River. This is a picture of one of the uh, technicians who was attempting and it has turned out to be a failed cleanup effort. 40 miles of the Kalamazoo River in Michigan is still dead. The EPA and Enbridge have now both acknowledged that there is no method presently to clean up the tar sands release from, uh, uh, from that uh, rupture. The second one is a picture uh, taken uh, in Michelle Borland's backyard along the Kalamazoo River, it shows a blob of the uh, tar sands toxic slurry with a dead frog dissolving into the middle of it, and that was in her backyard. She can no longer live in that on that piece of property. This third picture uh, illustrates the uh, Exxon Pegasus pipeline rupture that happened near my home in Mayflower, Arkansas. This tar sands stream was released when uh, uh, a 65-year-old 20-inch diameter pipeline that was originally designated for U.S. sweet crude that was operating at 600 PSI was redesignated for transportation of Canadian tar sands bitumen and the carcinogenic solvents used in its transport and they increased the pressure to 1440 psi. This embrittled, corroded pipeline ruptured over a 22 foot length of its, of its uh, uh, expanse. My final picture is a picture of an elderly man having to evacuate his home in Mayflower, Arkansas after the failure of this same 65-year-old uh, Pegasus pipeline two and a half weeks ago. And I would like you to note the use of paper towels, which were the primary cleanup device that were used to clean up this toxic tar sands 
uh, catastrophe. As Enbridge and EPA have already stated, there is no neck no technology in existence at this time that can adequately protect the people and land of the United States when, not if, another such tar sands rupture happens. This photo makes it perfectly clear. If you can wrap up your comments. I will. Please. One more sentence. Until the petroleum industry has created the technology to repair this damage to our country that transport of tar sands clearly represents, the State Department must reject this dangerous transportation of tar sands toxic slurry across our home. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker number 16. Hello. I'm very happy to be here in Nebraska. We have delicious water. Um, I came from Arkansas as well. My name is Mrs. Druding. And um, I highly encourage everyone here to read the draft supplemental environmental impact statement because while waiting, I realized that nobody really has. Being a federal ex-federal worker, I'm familiar with the federal government, so I actually took some time to read it. And it didn't answer any questions to, for me as far as safety or as far as anything that's going on. What it did, it posed a lot more questions. It, it, it listed endless problems with the pipeline. It talked about there's going to be corrosion, there's uh, temperature changes that are going to affect the pipeline, there's manufacturing difficulties that are going to affect the pipeline. It's susceptible to human error. Um, in the automation, the pressure is going to be important. There's going to be pinhole leaks that will leak, and how important it is to keep it away from any body or water sources. And I'm thinking, wow, the aquifer, you know, it's going to go right through there. Um, if paper towels are the only thing that we have to clean up, I'm a little concerned about that. And also, you mentioned something about strong opposing views, Teresa. I, I disagree. I think everybody here, including the union people, all want clean drinking water and clean food and clean beef and to go fishing with their children. Okay? We're not at each other. We're not, it's, we're not enemies. We're all together. It's the multinational corporations that are making billions off of us, and they're considered people. But they're people that don't need to eat. They don't breed. They don't reproduce. We do. We're real people. And I'm tired of this division. You know, we don't need to look at any more impact statements. We have enough history right here, enough tar sands to know that we don't know what's going on. Also, I looked to see what's the definition of tar sands. I couldn't find one. There were 10 different uh, possibilities. It could possibly be this and possibly be that and maybe this. And so the problem then is, you have this mix in the pipeline and you don't know what's going in there. You don't know what's on your property. You don't know what's being leached into your water and it is being leached. Because we went into Oklahoma to look where they were putting in part of the KXL pipeline and there were creeks and uh, uh, rips in those pipelines that you could see light through that they were putting in under the cover of darkness at night. The works crews, they put it in and then they cover it so you don't see it. So it's not another matter of when or how. This stuff is going to leak. It's going to leak regularly into the aquifer. These people need to know that. Is that in our best U.S. national interest? I don't think so. And when these crude oil, originally, there was a certain percentage of it that went into a, um, a fund where, in case of spill, they had money there. With the tar sand, they don't have to do that. There's no funding for that. So when there's an accident, the, the landowner will be held individually liable. Eminent domain purpose was never to usurp and take over land for uh, foreign corporations. It was meant to help local people with their local government. So I thank you for your time. I thank you for the wonderful drinking water. This is global genocide. This is going to tip us over. Your children will not survive. Watch the movie Chasing Ice. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Jim Tarnick, J-I-M-T-A-R-N-I-C-K. And I'm a landowner, farmer, and rancher on the proposed reroute of the Keystone XL pipeline. Through this ground and along a stretch of 8 to 10 miles between the Loop and Platte rivers, the proposed pipe will be sitting in the water table. Also working against the high water tables are sandy and alkali soils, which eat away at stainless steel. Pumping columns and wells must be pulled up to change bolts that are corroding away. Even steel posts in the ground only have a five-year life as they are eaten away under the ground. This pathway of water leads directly to the Ogallala Aquifer, which lies underneath me. 
Where is the environmental analysis and economic study when a spill would occur here? Where are the soil studies and water analysis done of this region on the route? Where are your consulting firms of Insights Energy and ICF International getting their information that sees no environmental impact when our own natural resource districts are concerned about keeping this water clean and usable? Why don't you use independent analysis to balance the direct conflict of interest that Insights Energy and ICF International bring with their ties to the oil industry? It seems this environmental impact statement has just as many holes as the pipelines that keep leaking their way into our news. Even though it is a common practice for you to farm out such studies, do we expect this from all of our government agencies to outsource their governmental responsibilities on projects that are this large and controversial? The funny part about this is transporting this diluted bitumen is not even taxed into the Oil Spill and Liability Trust. Isn't this at least an economic impact? Why not give more time to study processes of cleaning up diluted bitumen and see what the environmental impact is? I'm sure people around the Kalamazoo River and Mayflower will say they have been impacted. The pictures of oil-covered wildlife in Mayflower sure show an environmental impact. This study needs a proper environmental and economic impact of a spill. It has been stated there will be only 35 permanent jobs on this proposed pipeline. I can tell you just in my farming community, community that an oil spill will affect 100 jobs and hundreds if not thousands of people. Would I ever be able to farm and ranch again? Will the country make up the loss of agricultural products destroyed by an oil spill? These are questions that need to be answered and I hope this answer isn't going to come from a wait and see when it happens attitude. Finally, I find it hypocritical of this government agency, the Department of State of the United States to comment on the human rights in other nations while you support and let a foreign country trample my own human rights and the rights of my neighbors for their economic gain. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to Nebraska. Can you identify yourself? Yes. Please? Thank you. My name is Britton Bailey. Big oil contractors like Entrix and now ERM, with the current Supplemental Environmental Impact Study, have no business conducting environmental risk assessments for the KXL. No surprise, they see minimal risk. But someone please tell me how big oil contractors can provide anyone today, anyone here today, with a credible, unbiased environmental risk assessment of the KXL. For starters, we don't have a list of the chemical dilutants that are added to the tar sands to create the lethal bitumen brew. How can Entrix or ERM even begin an environmental impact study without this list? If you do not know what's in those pipes, your environmental study impact studies are incomplete, seriously flawed, and bogus. Remember the previous hearings when the oil industry experts and executives told us the threat to the Ogallala Aquifer, our rivers, our lakes, was minimal and the bitumen crude, uh, that bitumen crude floats? Remember? Do you think the Kalamazoo, Michigan people believe that lie today? We are also learning that no one on planet Earth knows how to clean up a bitumen tar sand spill. Can ERM share with the public and press today the rate at which unknown bitumen chemicals are dispersed when they come into contact with water? Can you? We do know that rare cancer rates have increased dramatically along the indigenous, or among the indigenous nations who live downstream of the tar sands operations in Alberta. We also know that cancerous growths on fish have dramatically increased surrounding the tar sands mining operations. Is this not environmental impact or genocide? Let's also consider the bitumen tar sands rupture in May Mayflower, Arkansas, a little over a week ago. The horrific video and photos provided a gruesome reality check, as if a 22-foot rupture did not cause enough environmental damage, then came a mindless attempt to clean it up. Does the ERM-approved TransCanada Emergency Plan include power washing contaminants into wetlands and then covering them up with paper towels like they did down there? Exxon reported Friday that in Arkansas, even after the pumping stations 
valve, even after the pumping station and valves were finally shut down, gravity caused the bitumen tar sands to flow for 12 additional hours. Flow for 12 additional hours into an aquifer is unacceptable. Now factor in the KXL, 10 times the capacity of the ruptured Pegas line. 10 times the flow for 12 additional hours. Imagine the damage to the Platte River, the Ogallala Aquifer, or to the ranch or a rancher's future with such an extended 12-hour event. Can you wrap up your remarks, please? Uh, yes. Accountability is on Nebraska Governor Heinemann, Entrix, ERM, Secretary of State John Kerry, and President Obama if they fail to listen to the common sense reasoning and scientific fact. I ask that you expand the SEIS analysis to consider bitumen impacts on aquifers and waterways. Don't become the promoters of the biggest environmental holocaust against humanity ever. Thank you. Thank you.